That's why we are here this morning to celebrate. Praise the Lord. Good to see you all this morning. Good to see your shining faces, though it's cloudy and rainy outside. It's bright and sunny in here. Praise God for that. I've got a number of uh, bulletin highlights. I'm going to try to get through them quickly. Uh, if you uh, have a child in uh, Sunday school, today is Promotion Sunday. So play, pay special attention to where your child is going to go to, to class. It could be... If they've moved up, they may need to go to a different class. If you have any, any direction, you need direction, we'll have somebody posted back there that will give you direction. Kinship groups start on the 23rd. <clears throat> Kinship groups are a core ministry of this church. We believe that the minimum a, a, the child of God should be doing is worshiping together here on Sunday morning and doing the one anothering that needs to be done on, in kinship groups, which is a small microcosm of the, of the main church. So if you're interested, you're involved in a kinship group, great. We start on the 23rd. If you're not involved in a kinship group, in the back, uh, Lori and Bob Gill would be glad to talk to you and get you signed up and get you plugged in. Men's breakfast is coming up next Saturday, men. Next Saturday at 7.30 to 9.30, we'll continue in our series, uh, Be Ye Holy. We're going to be focusing in on the accountability of holiness from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. You don't want to miss this event. And if you would like to help set up, the doors open at 5.30 in the morning. You'll be truly hungry by 7.30. Uh, we had, and some of you might know, we had a summer reading program, <clears throat> and I have to uh, introduce you to some people, well, maybe not introduce you, but acknowledge some people. The summer, 34 children signed up for the Garden Growth Library summer reading program with a total of 17 super readers. Uh, we would like to congratulate the grand prize winner, Alyssa Shanley. I don't know if Alyssa's here this morning, but certainly if you see your congratulators, uh, she won $35 CBD gift card, and we'll get to choose the book titles to display during the recommended reading months throughout the year. Kudos go to the super readers. In addition to five announced uh, midsummer when we, when we announced them, uh, the following had now reached the super reader status. Andrew Hutchinson, Naomi Brimer, Zach Josh, and uh, Brennan Donnelly. Uh, Bennett Hardy, Caitlin Shanley, Lynn Edwins, uh, Joey Kish, Colton and Travis Denlinger, and Jonathan Kagamaster. If I've mispronounced your name, just humor me. Uh, 
who will each receive a Rita's gift card, and uh, the winners can pick up that gift card in the garden cafe, not the garden cafe, the garden library. We don't have a garden cafe, so just strike that last one. And one other announcement that's not in uh, this morning's announcement, the WANA begins on the 12th. We still are in need of about 10 volunteers. So if you want to sign up, and you, the Lord has been pressing upon your heart to be involved with the WANA, go online, sign up as a volunteer. First Chronicles 16, 8 through 10 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That's what we've come here this morning to do. Great is our God. We've come to rejoice and praise and worship his name. So let's stand before we take time to worship God. Let's greet one another this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ebenezer Bible Fellowship Church. It's great to have each and every one of you here today. So we sang Our God Saves in the prelude. We're going to sing that again. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we gather together in your name. So let's sing together Our God Saves.
my life I surrender. This is a new song we sang last week and the chorus says, all I am my life defined by, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. We sing from Galatians. Let's sing together and worship him, life defined. present time 
so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, our Jesus Messiah. Let's sing of that. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself
with those songs of praise in our heart. Let's go before the throne of grace this morning. (laughs) Father, as we enter your presence, it never ceases to amaze us that we can enter your presence. The very fact that Jesus Messiah, the anointed one, was sent from heaven. Jesus, the very Son of God, sent to this earth, take upon himself our flesh, flesh like ours, yet without sin, in order to ransom us, a ransom a people unto yourself, a people that you have called before the foundations of the earth to be your people. Jesus came. Jesus the Messiah, the Anointed One, came. And there on the cross, he took our sins. And he endured your wrath for our sins. And he was buried and he rose again the third day victoriously. And that he is now in heaven making intercession for us, your children. Father, the fact of that reality, we don't want to pass over that so quickly, but we want to continually be in awe of the great salvation. Our God saves. It's an amazing message. We have a message of hope, even in this evil world. Father, help us to live out our lives on this world, in this evil world, with the reality that we have been redeemed, we have been saved, we are sons of God. Father, may we proclaim the message of hope to a lost and dying world. We have a saving God. Father, I thank you this morning from the bottom of our hearts with the with the the most we can, with the words that sometimes fail us, we praise and worship you this morning for your greatness, for your goodness, for your steadfast love, for the very fact that you saw us before you created all things, that we were in Christ before the foundations of the earth were laid, that Jesus was a lamb that was slain even before the foundations of the earth. Father, we praise you for that reality, that truth. Help us to transform our lives. Help us to transform who we are here on this earth as as fathers, as husbands, as mothers, as wives, as employers and employees, as citizens, as neighbors. May it transform our lives. May people see that we belong to you. Father, I pray now that you would prepare our hearts. There's nothing greater that we can do than to listen to to you speak to us. Transform us by your word. Fill Pastor Tim with the power of your Holy Spirit, with the authority of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your word. Transform us by it now, we pray. May you remove the distractions from our minds that we would see clearly and hear clearly what you have to say to us this morning. We say this in precious name of Jesus. Amen. Again, we want to welcome you this morning. We Praise the Lord that you've come to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We'd ask you to take the black pads and you would pass them down the aisle. And if you would legibly sign in this morning and uh, uh, record for us your attendance, we really, really appreciate that. There is an outline in that black book for this morning's sermon. If you want to take that and use that to take notes since Pastor Tim is about to preach. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we want to especially welcome you we, we hope you felt welcome already, and we'd ask our, our uh, regular attendants to make all of our visitors feel welcome. But if you would take time to, as a visitor to fill out that card in the black book and put it in the offering plate or in the welcome center when you leave, we would really, really appreciate that. Now we're going to continue in our worship this morning in the giving of our tithes and offerings as the men come forward. This song that we'll be doing is out of Isaiah 12, verses 2 and 3. And we will be singing this song in both English and in Hebrew. So um, we'd ask that you would worship our God who is our salvation with us. Try 
morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. If you're visiting with us, I see some new faces with us this morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We uh, take about 30 to 40 minutes every Sunday to open God's Word and to study it. And we are in John, chapter 6. We're working our way through this wonderful Gospel. It's my favorite, one of my favorite books. Every book I study becomes my favorite, right? I think that's the way it is. This has become one of my favorite books in all the Bible. It tells us about Jesus we get to see him, we get to hear his teaching, we get to see the gospel unfold and the miracles of Christ unfold. I've entitled this series that you may believe that comes right out of the purpose statement of the book, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. I don't hesitate to continue to say that this is the purpose and keep reiterating this week after week. John writes that you might believe. He says, I write these things to you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ that He is the Son of God, and that if you believe that, you have life in His name. This is the whole purpose of why John writes, so that you may have eternal life. There are crucial things that you must believe in order to be saved. You must believe that Jesus was the One whom the Father sent. You must believe that He was God in the flesh and that He died for us on the cross. You must believe that He is the bread of life and that by eating of Him and Him alone, you can have everlasting life. Well, we're in John chapter 6. Let me give you just a little bit of background where we are. You remember Jesus has fed the thousands. In chapter 6, verse 1, He fed thousands, possibly 20,000 or more people with just a little boy's fish and bread. Held them up to the Lord, gave thanks, and Jesus miraculously in just a few moments fed thousands. That miracle is recorded in all of the Gospels. That's how significant it is. And it's so significant that the crowds pressed in to make Jesus king, but they didn't want Jesus to be the king that he wanted to be. They wanted him to be a physical king, a king who would deliver them from physical oppression. And so Jesus begins to teach them that he came to be not a physical king, but a spiritual king who offered himself as the bread of life. And that's kind of the theme of this whole chapter, is the bread of life. Jesus himself offered himself as the bread, not like the manna that came down out of heaven in the wilderness and fed the thousands of Israelites in the wilderness, but this bread is a bread that will not only give you, will not just not give you physical life, but will give you eternal life. And we're not surprised, we've been looking at this, if you've been with us for a while, we've been looking at chapter 6 particularly, and we keep noticing that the crowds reject Jesus. Now, you have to put yourself in the context of this chapter. Thousands of people are following Christ. Thousands, 20,000, you imagine 20,000 people. I don't know if I've ever been in a crowd, well, basketball games, football games, that kind of thing. You can imagine a whole stadium worth of people following Jesus on the mountainside, and he's teaching them. And yet we see that they reject him. This particular chapter, he offers himself as the bread of life. And yet verse 36, and we're going to read this together, it says that he is rejected by them. Now let me ask you this question as we dive in this morning in the introduction. Have you ever wondered whether Jesus could have ever failed in his mission? He came to seek and save those who are lost, according to Luke 19, verse 10. And yet, when Jesus left this earth, he only had a small band of followers compared to the vast number of numbers in Israel, and for that matter, of the world that remained lost. And even today, after 2,000 years of church history, listen, thousands are still lost, aren't they? Let's be honest, the majority of the world's population still remain unbelievers. So the question is, did Jesus fail? Has God, God's purpose failed? That same question is the same question that the Apostle Paul 
um, put forward in Romans chapter 9 when looking at the massive rejection of Jesus by the Jews, by Israel, it appeared as though God's promises had failed. And yet the Apostle Paul says very clearly, it's not as though the word of God has failed because not all of Israel is Israel. And then the Apostle Paul very clearly lays out in that particular chapter, God's word didn't fail because God never intended to save all of Israel. I only bring that up in Romans chapter 9 because that's the same argument that Jesus uses here in this particular chapter in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, the crowds are failing to come to Jesus. The masses of people have eaten the miraculous meal of loaves and fishes and they're asking to do a sign greater than that of Moses, right? And verse 34, Jesus tells them, listen, I've given you this bread. And they say, well, give us this bread. And they're, they're wanting physical food. And Jesus offers him, himself to the crowds and yet they reject him. Verse 36, he says to them, you have seen me and yet you do not believe. You do not believe. Verse 66, and we've highlighted this in chapter 6, verse 66, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Can you imagine how discouraging this would have been for Jesus? I said early on in the study of this chapter, this may be one of the saddest chapters in all the Bible. That's why Isaiah 53 says Jesus was a man of sorrows as the crowds rejected Jesus. If some can see Jesus and His miraculous signs, and yet still they don't come to faith, does that suggest that the mission of Jesus was somehow a measure of failure? Is God's saving purposes thought to be frustrated? Well, no, not actually. Because what we're going to see in this particular chapter is that Jesus, Jesus' confidence is not in the response of the people. Now here's where we're going, and here's where the title of the message comes from this morning. Jesus' confidence is not in the, the will of the people, but rather the sovereign grace of His Father in heaven. So this morning we're going to be looking at this topic, understanding the doctrine of election. Far from it, rather than confidence um, in the people, the confidence of Jesus is in His Father's will to bring to pass the Father's redemptive purposes on the earth. In fact, several times in this chapter we're going to read, Jesus says, all the Father has given to me will come to me. So Jesus' confidence in the success of His mission is based frankly on the doctrine of predestination. It was a comfort for Him. We'll read it, you'll see it. As he looks at the crowds, he finds comfort in the sovereign grace of his Father. Now you, do, you and I do the same thing, don't you? Times are tough, troubles, are troubles come, and what do we do? We lean in on the sovereign grace of God. That's exactly what Jesus does in this chapter. He looks at the massive crowds who are rejecting him, and he leans in on his Father's sovereign grace and says, listen, I know that all that the Father has given to me will come to me, and I will lose none of them. Jesus is very clear, but he understands very clearly this Revelation 5 verse 9 says that in the end there will be people from every tribe and every nation and every language around the throne worshiping him. So this morning we're going to be looking at understanding the doctrine of election. We're going to be reading John chapter 6, reading verses 35 through verse 71 together. If you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible there in front of you. Turn to page uh, 892. And let's study together for just a, a few moments. This may be a new doctrine for some of you. If it is, pay close attention to it. Let's study it together. It shouldn't be new to most of you. All of our members should at least understand this and have come to an agreement to it. At least we say we agree to it because we believe the Bible teaches it. We may not understand it fully, but we come to strive to understand it. So we're in the text of Scripture. We're going to read it, and we want to show to you this morning how it unfolds. So if you will, stand with me in honor of God's Word. Let's read together John chapter 6. Let's begin in verse 35 and read down to the end of the chapter in order to get all the context of the passage that we're looking at. John 6, 35. Jesus says to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me 
that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. We'll say that four times. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is it not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught, of, taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of, my, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's the fourth time it's been said. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and, and drinks of my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do not take offense at this. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your word now. We pray the Holy Spirit would have come and help us understand. Father, be gracious to us as we open your word. Our heart's desire as believers is to be as most faithful to your word as we can. So help us, Father, as we try to understand the deep things of your word. Some of these things are mysterious to us. Some of these things we've been studying for a long time as believers, and we still can't sometimes wrap our minds around them, and yet there's no way possible we can deny the doctrine of election. It's on every, every page. How we understand it is another thing. Father, teach us. Father, bless us now. Allow the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and lead us into your perfect will and perfect truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Keep your Bibles open and follow along with us. On your outline, you'll have some places to follow along with us. If you didn't grab an outline, grab one. The main idea of the message this morning is the election of God's people is not only a comfort, but a foundation of certain success for Jesus and for future ministry of his followers. The doctrine of election is a hard doctrine to wrap our minds around. Maybe it's a doctrine you haven't spent much time thinking about. Um, some preachers, I'll be honest with you, right at the get-go, some preachers won't even touch this topic. Um, I made a commitment many years ago when I committed to preach God's Word on a regular basis in an expository way that when the text comes to me, I will preach it as faithfully as I can. And I intend to do that this morning to unfold God's Word with you. 
On your outline, on the back side, if you will, just flip over to the back side and you'll see a clear definition of the doctrine of election. This comes out of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology book. It's a very clear, in fact, it's very close to the article of the Bible Fellowship Church, Article 11, right underneath it. I give it to you. But here's what, how we would define election. An election is simply the act of God before creation in which God chose some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign and good pleasure. And then there are many listed references there that you can go reference. The article in our Bible Fellowship uh, Statement of Faith, Article 11, says election is a free act of the sovereign God in which from eternity, for reasons only known to himself and apart from any foreseen faith and or goodness found in man, God, he graciously chose from among the fallen mankind a people unto salvation that they might be conformed to Christ's image. Those so chosen, He redeemed by His Son and seals by His Spirit. So here, kind of a launching pad for us is just a simple definition of the doctrine of election. That God, in eternity past, chose some to be His children apart from any merit that He sees in them to be His children. And the basis of that election is the basis of our security. Our security in Christ is not based upon the free will of what we do, but rather on the sole sovereign grace and mercy of God. Now, when we come to the doctrine of election, it's hard to say the Bible doesn't teach it because it's on every, pa- it's on every page almost. If you study the Bible long, you see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament as well. How we understand it is a different thing, and that's what I want to do this morning. I want to go to John 6, and I want to unfold to you at least three truths about the doctrine of election that we see right here in this text. I won't be able to answer all of your questions. If you want to talk or debate, I'm open to it. We, we are, as Christians, want to be as sharp as we can. We want to understand the great things of God the best we can. So let's talk about it in a Christ-honoring way. But this morning, I just want to lay out for you what I see in the text. Three things about understanding the doctrine of election really that come from the context of this passage where the masses are rejecting Jesus and he gives us if you will pulls back the curtain and gives us an insight to why this is happening why this is happening and how someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior you've come to know Christ this morning how did you do that was that because you were someone greater than someone else you were smarter than someone else or was it because of some sovereign work of God's grace in your heart and in your life and I think it's the latter as we'll see clearly I think from this text so on your outline you see three things we're gonna look at the present not the present time but the present the gift We're going to look at the process, and we're going to look at, third, the promise. All from this text, okay? And then next week we'll come back and close up the chapter together. All right, so let's look at number one, the present. The present. Who are the elect? Well, the elect are a predetermined sovereign gift from the Father, from God the Father to Jesus. The elect are a predetermined sovereign gift from God the Father to Jesus. Now, Jesus' mission was certain. If you'll notice the subtitle of my message this morning, it's the certain success of Jesus' mission. Jesus didn't come with the hopes that He might redeem some people. Rather, there was a group of people that the Father has given to the Son. And Jesus has come not to do His will, but the will of the Father who sent Him Verse 34, verse 35, 36, 37 has all of this. Verse 36 is this universal invitation, which by the way might seem contradictory, but it's not, and we'll talk about that. Jesus provides a universal invitation to all people to come to Him. Those who eat of Him will never hunger, and those who believe in Him shall never thirst. But then in verse 36, Jesus sees clearly that they have seen, and yet they do not believe. Verse 37 tells us something clear about this. Look at it, verse 37. Here's where we're getting this first point. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Look at verse 39. Very clearly he says the same thing. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me. But Raise it up on the last day. There's an interesting phrase here, all that the Father has given to me. 
Jesus says it twice here. He says it some more times in John 10 and John 17, and we're going to read some of those here in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 1, you say, well, when did this happen? Well, clearly, Ephesians chapter 1 says, before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Him. He chose us in Him to be holy and blameless. So when did this happen? It happened in eternity past, when the Father gave a gift to His Son. And here Jesus is really clear that there is a group that the Father has given to me. And in fact, I've come to do the will of the Father. And what is that? To secure the salvation of all that the Father has given to me. John chapter 10. Stay in John with me for just a moment and flip to John chapter 10. I want you to look at some other passages that teach this truth as well. John chapter 10. Look at it in verse 29. John chapter 10, verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I give these all on your outline. You can go look again. But go to chapter 17. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 6. This is the priestly prayer of Jesus. And four times, four times in this particular passage, and three or four times in this passage, no, I'm sorry, five times in this chapter, chapter 17, Jesus says the exact same thing. John chapter 17, verse 2. Look at it. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Two times in verse 6. John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. And you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Chapter 17, verse 9, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And then in verse 24 of chapter 17, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So it's clear here that there is a gift that the Father has given to the Son, He's given to the Son. Now, I want to highlight this for just a moment because there will be a debate about this. I want you to know at least where the Bible Fellowship Church stands, where we stand. This is not based upon foreknowledge. Some might argue, yes, well, we believe in the doctrine of predestination. We believe in the doctrine of election. But certainly it is, it's based on the fact that God looks down the corridors of time and He sees that certain people are going to believe and therefore based upon how they believe, He elects them. We deny that altogether. In fact, if you do a little study of the word foreknow, it's not of actions, it's always of persons. Of persons. God foreknew persons. He knew them. Jesus, in verse 36 of John chapter 6, knew that there were going to be many who would not believe in Him. Why, was, why were they not believers? Well, it wasn't because they didn't have the best evidence. They had the best evidence, and yet... They love darkness. Chapter 3, verse 19 says they love darkness rather than the light. Rather than the light. So they're separated from Christ, spiritually dead, and this is what we're going to look at in the second point. But they don't come to Christ because, because they are in their sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says Satan has blinded their eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 speaks of that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 speaks of their spiritual understanding that is darkened. John chapter 8, verse 43, Jesus comes and asks the Jews very clearly, why don't you believe in me? And then he gives an answer to that. He says, well, you cannot come to me because you cannot hear me. You cannot hear my word. Well, it's not that they didn't hear it with their ears. They didn't hear it with their heart. So here's the first thing that we see from this text is that there is a present that God gives to the Father. Now, this is seen in all of Scripture. I don't have time to do a full survey of the doctrine of election, but here we at least see it in this particular chapter. Second, I want us to move to the process. The process. So, we look at the present, but I want us to look at the process of how this happened. And Jesus lays it out for us very clearly. And I want you to pay close attention to at least two truths that Jesus gives us. Here's the process. The elect will inevitably come to Jesus because the Father graciously, and I'm using these words very, very purposefully, because the Father graciously grants and graciously draws them. So if you will, be 
be patient with me as I try to unfold all of this. Jesus is unfolding for us, kind of pulling back the curtain for us, letting to look back into this scene and seeing what is happening and what's, what's being unfolded here in this particular chapter. Jesus says that these crowds are not coming again in verse 36, but he leans on the sovereignty of his Father's will in verse 37. He knows that all the Father has given him will come to him. Verse 38, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose none of them, none of all that the Father has given me. They will come to me, but I will raise them up on the last day. Now look at, down, look at verse 44. The, the, the Jews begin to grumble at him, saying that he's this bread. Isn't he just Joseph? Isn't he this, got this mother and father that we know? Isn't he just a human? And they begin to grumble. He says, don't grumble that I said I've come down from heaven. And then verse 43, look at it. He says, don't grumble among yourselves. Verse 44, very clear. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's pretty explicit. No one. I'm just unfolding for you what Jesus has provided for us here. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Over at the end in chapter 6, verse 60 and down through verse 65, Jesus will again, we'll, highlight, we'll kind of unfold this here as we go, but verse 65, Jesus says to the crowds, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. So in this doctrine of election, it's very clear. How does the elect come? They come because they've been granted. They've been drawn by the mercy of God to come to Jesus. So let me give you two, two truths here with two things under each one. All right, So two truths. Here's the first one. Number one, no one is able to come to God on their own. That should be very clear, but the thousands and thousands of people are here seeing all the evidence needed to come to Christ, and yet they don't come. Why don't they come? Jesus says it's clear. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them. No one can come to me unless it's been granted to them by the Father. So there is a sovereign mercy and a sovereign grace we don't have time to go to Romans chapter 9, but it's very clear. Paul, the Apostle Paul, says the very same thing in Romans chapter 9. So then it does not depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs, but it depends upon God who has mercy. It's not clear. It is clear in Romans chapter 9 that God does not have mercy upon all. These are hard things, brothers and sisters, and yet we come we come to the text of Scripture and we try to do our best to understand it. So no one is able to come to God on their own. Very clear, Jesus tells us that. The reason is because two things under here, every human does not seek God. Every human is unrighteous and does not seek God. We know that the doctrine of sin is very, very potent. Romans chapter 3 is very clear, very clear. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is Paul's conclusion after looking at mankind and looking at all the Jews and looking at all the Gentiles. He comes to this conclusion that all are in sin and all mouths are closed and no one will come to God. No one is able to come to God. And secondly, every human is a slave to sin and is unable to come to God in his own ability. We don't have time to do a study about sin this morning, but let me give you a few verses here. And I think I'll give you at least two. Romans 6, 6 says we're slaves to sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says that the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, the mind set on the flesh, nor is it even able to do so. Which tells us that the mind set on the flesh, that is an unbeliever, his mind is so hostile toward God that he doesn't submit to God's law, nor does he even have the capability to do so. The Bible is pretty explicit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We are, were, if we are in Christ, now you're no longer dead in your sins, but before you came to Christ, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. You had no ability to do anything spiritually. A dead man cannot respond to any stimulus at all. And in the same way, an unbeliever cannot respond to the grace of God unless first the grace of God comes to him. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the unbeliever, the natural man, is un unable to understand the things of God. They're foolishness to him. And we could go on and on and on. 
You speak to people when you share the gospel with them, don't you? And you pray that God will open their hearts. I did that this week. I shared the gospel with someone this week. And I prayed as I was sharing the gospel with them. But you know, it was interesting. They had no interest in it at all. I brought up the fact that death was coming. I asked them very clearly, have you considered death? Have you considered that you're going to die? They said, well, no, don't really think about that. I said, well, does that concern you? And they said, no, not really. Why is that the case? Why do we pray for lost people? We pray that God would do the saving work. We pray, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, that God would make them alive. Evangelism is not us trying to get people saved. Evangelism is us sharing the gospel in hopes that God, the Father, in His sovereign grace, would make someone alive and allow them to come to Jesus Christ. That's why we pray for the lost. Well, that leads to the second truth. So the first one is no one is able to come. But secondly, and this is, the, this is the beauty of what this passage tells us, God uses the gospel to draw the elect. To draw the elect. Theologians call this irresistible grace. And it will happen without exception because it rests not on human will, but on the grace of God's will, which He is able to accomplish. Notice in this passage, Jesus says several times, all that the Father has given to me will come to me, and I will lose none of them. Here's the process. God's grace and mercy draws His elect. Sinners draws them without exception, and they will come. You say, well, pastor, that sounds like that God's going to drag them kicking and screaming against their will. No, no one comes to Christ unwillingly. Rather, it means that God makes sinners willing to come to Christ. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, preached to, to the, the Christian, Christians there, the, the unbelievers in Acts 16, you remember Lydia was there. Lydia, it says in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart and she responded to the things spoken by Paul. Listen, God opened her heart and she received the gospel of Jesus Christ. She would not have responded favorably had God's grace and mercy not been extended to her. Listen, and this morning, I believe with all my heart, if you're a Christian this morning, listen, if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, it's because the Lord opened your heart. He opened your heart. Because of God's sovereign grace, the Father poured upon you. He opened your eyes and your heart, and you came by the grace of God. Listen, all that the Father has given to Jesus will come to Him. No sinner will thwart thwart God's mighty will to accomplish His purposes. So let me give you two things here to unfold it. We see it right here in Jesus' words. How does this happen? How does God draw the elect or grant them His mercy? Two things, very clear. Number one, the Father will teach. And Jesus unfolds this. Look at it in verse oh, 40. We'll start in verse 44. Look at it. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus now says in verse 45, it is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. That's me, he who has seen the Father. So truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. So notice what Jesus says here very clearly, all that, the Father come, all that the Father has given to me will come to me. And how do, how do they come? Well, they will be taught by God. There's a miraculous thing that happens in the hearts of sinners. When God, in His mercy, in His grace, teaches them and draws them, we could use... In fact, I think Jesus is probably quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 13 there. But we could go to Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34, or Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 26. On your outline, I give that to you, where it says that God will give His people a new heart. He will take out stone of heart and give them a stone of flesh. This is the work of God. The sole sovereign grace of God in, in, the, in the heart of sinners. God will do it. He will teach it. Now, so that's the first thing, but there's a second thing. Number two, the Holy Spirit will give life. And Jesus highlights this again when the people begin to complain about Jesus. Look over at verse 61. Jesus, knowing in Himself that His disciples were grumbling about this and said to them, do not take offense at this. He said, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? 
verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh, listen, the flesh is no help at all. What is Jesus saying right there? There's no ability in human flesh. There's no ability in your own human person to come to Christ. The human flesh has no power in itself. It has no help at all. Same as John chapter 3 when Jesus told Nicodemus, listen, don't be surprised when I tell you you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is a flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that you must be born again. How are you born again? Well, just like you were born physically outside of your own control, none of you determined that you would be born physically. The same is true spiritually. Something else happens to you. It's called the mercy and the grace of God. And here, Jesus highlights this. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't hesitate to say I don't understand all of this. I'm not even so sure to say I like it all, but I do submit to the Scripture and believe what the Bible teaches. I have no other way to do it. We have no other revelation than what God's Word gives us. These are hard passages. There's a lot of hard passages in the Bible. We're trying to unfold all of these things, but we're not going to skip over them. We need to understand them. We need to try to dive in and understand them. Some of you might say, well, you know, I just don't understand how it is that, that God would you know, select some and not others, to which Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, well, I find it more difficult to understand how God could choose anyone how God could love anyone, how God could be merciful or gracious to anyone, and yet that's what we see in the real mystery of election. is not that some are not chosen, but rather that God would choose any at all to be saved. None of us deserve it. And if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, it's solely by the grace and mercy of God. Now, so that's the first two points. We see the present. We see the process. And then there's a third thing, and we can't miss this. Here's the promise. The promise is glorious. If you're one of the elect and you're one of God's children, then here is the promise. The elect will be raised by Jesus on the last day. Jesus says it four times. Here is the basis of your security. Not your own free will, but the comfort of the sovereign grace of God. Notice four times. I highlight it in my Bible at the end of verse 30, 39. I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40, raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, I will raise him up on the last day. And again, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. By the way, there's a progression here. Notice, notice all that the Father has given to me, I will raise him up. But then he moves from that to whoever believes and whoever feeds on my flesh. So listen, it's not, and, and here's the balance. Listen to me, it's not that the elect don't have to believe. No, they have to believe. And they will believe. And they will come. Jesus says they will believe and they will come. And we, listen, we do not deny the whosoever will come. And that's why we preach the gospel to all people. We preach the good news to all people. Because you know what, here's the bottom line. We don't know who the elect are. We don't know who they are. So essentially, what do we do? We preach the good news to all people. And we leave the details to God. We leave the undergirdings and the sovereign grace to God. But notice this promise. Jesus promises, all that the Father has given to me, I will raise them up, him up on the last day. I will raise them up on the last day. Two promises here. Number one, the elect will come to Jesus and will never be cast out. We see that up in verse 37 again. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. That's a backwards way of saying it in a, in a positive way. The positive way would say I would receive them, but he says in a negative way I'm not going to cast them out. It means this, whoever comes to me I will certainly welcome. Or maybe a little stronger, not just welcome, but I will preserve. Now this is beautiful. I will preserve. I will certainly keep. I will never drive them away, but I will keep them. I will keep them. Which means, here's the second thing, the elect who come to Jesus are eternally secure. Eternally secure. And I want to quote John chapter 10 here, and we've got it, but you, you're familiar with this passage. Listen, my sheep hear my voice. 
and I know them, and they follow me. This is one of the most comforting verses in all the Bible. Listen, my sheep, not, not everyone, but my sheep, hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them, them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So here very clearly, Luther says of this verse, this is the will of Him who sent Jesus, that I would lose nothing. He says He will not refrain from expelling or rejecting anyone, but He also is resolved to keep them with Him and prevent anyone else from taking them from Him. No one is going to steal the elect from Jesus. No one. He's going to preserve them. He's going to keep them. Listen, the mission of Jesus will not fail. The mission of Jesus is certain. Certain. All the Father has given to Him will come to Him. Now, we're going to close, and I know there's lots of questions and things and you can ask later. If you'd like, send me an email. Come in in the office. Let's visit. We, I would love to do that. Let's continue to talk about these things. I can't, can't explain everything here, but if you have questions, you want to talk about these things, let's talk about them. Let's rub shoulders. Let's rub minds together and talk about them some more, okay? But here's my two points of application, all right? Two things to c- consider. Number one, let the doctrine of election encourage you to examine yourself. And I think there's a progression here when we see this. All the Father has given to me will come to me. I will lose none of them, but raise them up on the last day. But then when you continue to look down here, whoever believes in me, whoever eats of me. So here's the question. Are you one of the elect? How do you know you're one of the elect? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus? Have you received Him? Have you come to Him? Have you eaten of Him? Those who believe in the Son, verse 40, are the elect. So here's the question. Have you turned from your sin and believed on the Lord Jesus? That's really the application of all this. Have you repented of your sins? Or are you like the crowds who deny Jesus and grumble and complain and don't come to Him? Have you turned from your sin and come to believe on Jesus as the Christ? So examine yourself. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, make sure your election. Peter said, listen, make sure that you're one of the elect. Make sure that you're one of God's chosen. Make sure of that. If you're here and concerned about it, then you're in good company. But if you're not concerned about it and you don't care, then I tremble for you this morning. I tremble for you. Examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, again, 2 Peter, make sure your election. So encourage yourself. Listen, examine yourself. Secondly, number two, let the doctrine of election encourage you to exalt God. Exalt Him. Praise God for His amazing grace. If you're one of His children this morning, it wasn't because of yourself. Paul says, Boasting is excluded altogether. There's no room for boasting at all. If you're here and you're one of Jesus's, it's because of the mercy of God. He has mercy upon you. He has mercy and grace upon you. Compassion upon whom He has compassion. And this morning, if you've become a Christian, it's because of the grace of God. So you should close with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11. You should give praise to Him for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things to glory, be glory to Him forever. Amen. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Well, we come to a close. Some preachers never teach on the God's sovereignty. They say, well, you know, it's too controversial. Too divisive. Some argue that, well, they're just, it's just theoretical in nature. It doesn't have any, really in, any relevance to how we live on our, on our life. I've heard uh, people say all the time, listen, don't talk about the doctrine of election, especially with unbelievers, because it may run them off. Listen, Jesus spoke about the doctrine of election to unbelievers as a motive for them to come. Here, Jesus speaks plainly about election. We shouldn't be embarrassed of it. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's God's Word. It's God's Word. 
God's sovereign election should produce true humility in us as we give glory, all glory to God who graciously saves unworthy sinners. And, by the way, it encourages, should encourage us to share the gospel with everyone because we don't know who the elect are. And so we preach the gospel to all people knowing that just like the immoral Corinthians came to Christ, we will see other people saved. Other people saved. So let me encourage you. Keep studying this doctrine. Keep studying it. It is a crucial doctrine. It's a doctrine that we all must study and come, I believe, to understand. It's not a doctrine that you stick under the chair and ignore it. It's one that we should discuss and talk about. And this morning, the big question is, are you one of the elect? And if you hear the Gospel this morning and you come to Christ, then you are one of the elect. And we keep preaching to others in hopes that God would save more. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never studied this, never talked about it. Maybe you're here this morning and it's an abrasive doctrine to you. It's a, it's a doctrine that you don't like to talk about. And you're really quite honest. You're upset that the preacher's even preaching about it. Well, let's check our hearts this morning and ask God to continue to do a work in our hearts and to save those whom He will save. And may we be great evangelists as we go into the world, sharing the good news to all people, to all people, calling them to come and feast and eat upon Christ for the salvation of their souls. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for your word this morning. Some passages are hard. I pray, Father, that I preach with truth and clarity, but also with compassion and gentleness. And while we may not understand all of the details of the doctrine of election, we, we can't ignore it, nor can we deny it. How we understand it is a different thing, Father, but we pray that we would understand it clearly. And I think this passage, John 6, is very clear. We pray, Father, that you would continue to guide us and direct us. And Lord, I pray for us as a church, as we believe in this doctrine of election, may it never, may it never cause us to be so cold that we wouldn't go out and share the good news of Jesus. Oh, Father, help us to be expecting the elect to come. Therefore, we preach the gospel to all people, compelling all men to come and feast upon Jesus for the salvation of their souls. Father, thank You for Your Word. Bless it now. And continue to help us to be good students of Your Word. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Yes, we are having communion. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's bow our heads together. Men, come forward and help me with communion, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Won't you prepare yourself for communion? We're blessed to be able to come to this table this morning and participate in the body, uh, the, the symbols of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ for us this morning. And um, we ask God to bless now as we remember what Christ has done for us. So won't you prepare your hearts this morning? as we um, partake of the Lord's communion. Father in heaven, bless now as we partake and remember what Christ has done for us. We believe with all our hearts that this was a true redemption, that He went to the cross for His sheep. And so we're thankful for this. Bless now as we remember Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Men, you come, pass out the offering, pass out the elements, please.
What a precious time that we remember our Savior and what He did for us. For those who are His. And He will raise us up on the last day just like He Himself was raised up from the dead. If you're a believer this morning, this should be a moment of encouragement to you as we remember what Christ has done on the night that He was betrayed. He took bread and He broke it. He said, this is My body which is for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of Me. In the same way, He took the cup. And He said, this is the cup, the new covenant of My blood spilled out for you. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of Me. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. We thank God for His incredible gift that He's given to us. Every first Sunday of the month, we also take up a benevolent offering to help those in our church who are in need. We'll do that at this time. So if you'd like to give, uh, you can give as we close with our last song together. So ushers, you come, and we'll take up another offering.
redeems my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. Praise the Lord. And He is great, isn't He? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. If you're in Christ today, you have much to give praise to God for. Amen. Lord bless you. Hope you have a wonderful week. Preach the gospel to all people. Amen. See you next week. You're dismissed.